Sounds good. Oh, are you already on? Yeah. Oh, hello, everybody. Good morning, folks. This is Steve. I'm not in Southern Illinois today. I'm over in um, Oklahoma. And uh, Vivian just walked in and enjoy is joining me. Um, I couldn't find a really good venue this morning. Uh, outside, it's windy and rainy. And that means static on the microphone. Inside, the air conditioning is running so heavy. I hope that that's the uh, white noise isn't overwhelming. So enough for the apologies. It's good to be with you again today. Last week, our story centered on the liberation of the Waifang uh, civilian internment camp in China. This week, I want to go into some of the backstory. I think you'll find it interesting. You see, James Hudson Taylor III, the father in the story, was the grandson of James Hudson Taylor, one of my boyhood heroes. He was one of the first missionaries to go to China back in the 1800s. And when he got there, he discovered that wearing his black clerical attire uh, had led to him being called the Black Devil by the local people. So he had the courage to go native and he started wearing Chinese clothing and even changed his hairstyle, shaved, the, the, his, shaved his forehead and pulled his hair back into a long ton, ponytail, what we Westerners call the queue. Okay, uh, it was scandalous. All of the other Europeans just thought, thought he was just crazy. While he was there, he was influenced by George Mueller, who was known for prayer and faith. And he stopped working as a contract missionary and started what he called faith missionary, a faith missionary adventure. He depended on local donor, on volunteer donors for support rather than um, signing a contract with a denomination. And the result was the China Inland Missions, which recruited the largest body of missionaries and had the largest geographical footprint in China. He spent over 40 years serving the people of China. His son, Herbert Hudson Taylor, followed his, in his footsteps, serving for another 50 years. And now his grandson, James Hudson Taylor III, was preparing to follow in their footsteps with a twist. He had become a Methodist and he intended to be a Methodist missionary. And that's how he ended up in Greenville, Illinois, a mere hundred miles from my home in Fairfield, attending Greenfield, Greenville, Greenville College, which was a Methodist institution. But he got far more than an education. He got hitched. On June 24, 1924, he married Alice Elizabeth Hayes, who was a teacher in the preparatory department at the school. Two years later, his education finished, they set sail for China. He was to be the director of the new Methodist Bible School in Kaifang, China which is located 400 miles inland from where last week's story unfolded on the coast. In 1935, they came back to the United States on furlough for a year, along with three of their four children. Kathleen, the oldest, was nine years old, and she stayed behind in China in school. Jamie, five years old, Mary, four years old, and John, three, accompanied them back to the States. Two years later, they came, two years later, James and his family are back in China. It's summer. Grandma Taylor has died, and Grandpa's not doing well, so they had come to the coast 
to pack up his house and move him inland to Kaifeng to their home. But on July 7th, 1935, war broke out, the Japanese invaded, and all of those plans had to be scrapped. There was a lot of uncertainty in their lives there then. War was going on around them and they were in the thick of it. In early 1938, Alice wrote a letter home to her family to let them know that they were all safe. James by then had been able to make his way inland to the school in Chinese territory, but Alice and the children were still on the coast, which was controlled by the Japanese. Communications had been cut off, but she knows that less than a month before, fighting was going on all around the city where he was at. After telling them of the conditions at the school that she was aware of, and she started describing life with the children. And I'm just going to read you a part, some of her letter. Kathleen and Jamie are in school here. They are very glad that it's possible for them to live at home for once and go to school. It may be the only time in their life that they may do so. That's part of the missionary gig, folks. We have some wonderful times together. The past few days, we had heavy snowfall, and all four of them had great fun learning how to sleigh ride. Even Mary and John had fun learning to guide the sled down the hill just behind our house. Our Christmas this year was a wartime Christmas, but all of us had a happy time. I knit feverishly before Christmas, and when the children arose on Christmas morning, each one had a warm garment or two. At the time, they didn't think of Christmas as being much different than any other year. Until a day later, Jamie cheerfully remarked, Mother, we didn't get any toys for Christmas this year, did we? Toys. Not a parcel got through from the homeland, and we could buy nothing here that seemed suitable. And then she asks, how do I spend my time? Spread Chinese books before me and knit as I study. Or read a story to the children and knit. I only wish I could knit and type at the same time. If I could, you would hear from me more often. By the time I have cooked, baked, mended, and spent a little time with the children, bedtime is here, and I wonder where the day has gone. She smuggled the letter out by means of a passing American ship to avoid Japanese censors. But replies would have to come by regular mail, so she begged her family not to mention anything about the war in their replies because it would cause difficulty with the Japanese if, if uh, the censors caught it. Of course, they simply published it in the, local, the regional newspaper, which is why you can read the letter today. I could read the letter today on newspapers.com. Eventually, things appear to have settled down, though, enough for Alice to rejoin her husband but it was still dangerous because Japanese, Chinese, and communist forces were all jousting for control and will be the civilians that got caught in the middle. So the children all remained with grandpa on the coast where it appeared to be safest. And then came the events that I recounted last week. Japan and the US went to war and all of a sudden, all of the foreigners in Japanese territory became enemies. For five years, James and Alice heard nothing from their children. Battle lines shifted and they were forced to flee even further inland. A thousand miles now separated them from their children, or at least where their children were last that they had had word from them. Then Jap Japan surrendered but no word came. Fighting intensified between the communist and the nationalist Chinese forces, 
rail lines were destroyed, communications and transportation were completely disrupted. And then one day, Alice heard running footsteps outside her window. Then the front door opened and four voices shouted in unison, we're home, we're home, we're home. And the next thing she knew, she was enveloped as four pairs of arms wrapped themselves around her. Think about this for a minute. The home that the children were racing into was 600 miles away from any home that they had ever lived in. They had never been there before. They didn't know what it looked like. They didn't know how long it would be before once again, their lives were disrupted by war, but they were overjoyed to call it home because it was where mom and dad were. Our touchstone this week is your home in heaven. What does heaven mean to you? Pie in the sky by and by? That place where people want to go so that they don't get caught in that other place that's full of flames and pitchforks and the key passage in the Bible about heaven being our home is found in John chapter 14, one through three. And today I'm gonna to be reading the Bible passages out of the easy read version. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, don't be troubled, trust God and trust me. There are many rooms in my father's home. I would not tell you this if it weren't true. I'm going there to prepare a place for you after I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. Then I will take you with me so that you can be where I am. Once again, this imagery of having a place prepared for us echoes an interesting passage in Daniel's Big P prophecies. In chapter 10 and 12, Daniel records the last of his Big P prophecies. It ends with the, these words found in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 13. Daniel, at that time, the great Prince Michael will stand up. Michael is in charge of your people. There will be a time of much trouble, the worst time since nations have been on earth. But Daniel, remember this. At that time, every one of your people whose name is found written in the book of life will be saved. There are many who will be dead and buried. Some of them will wake up and live forever, but others will wake up to shame and disgrace forever. The wise people will shine as bright as the sky. Those who teach others to live right will shine like stars forever and ever. As for you, Daniel, go and live your life until the end. You will get your rest. At the end, you will rise from death and receive your share in the promise. Paul refers to this passage when he's talking to the Christians in Corinth about what happens after death. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. What we tell you now is the Lord's own message. Those of us who st are still living when the Lord comes again, will join him, but not before those who have already died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the people who have died and were in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive at that time will be gathered up with those who have died. We will be taken up in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air and we will live with the Lord forever. Heaven will not be our forever home. Revelation contains the last of the big P prophecies, and it ends with what Vivian calls the happy ending. Revelation 21, one through five is where I'm gonna be reading. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth the first heaven and the first earth had disappeared. 
Now, this isn't talking about heaven like we usually think about heaven. The same word applied to sky and earth and heaven. So really what it's saying, I saw a new sky and a new earth. The first sky and the first earth had disappeared. Now there was no sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It was prepared like a bride dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne. It said, now God's home is with people. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sadness, no more crying or pain. All the old ways are gone. The one who was sitting on the throne said, look, I make everything new. And then he said, write this because these words are true and can be trusted. How does this serve as a source of strength in our spiritual lives? Well, for me, heaven is two things. It's a place and a time where all injustice has been ended. The last tear has been shed because the last sorrow has been suffered. Faith will become seeing. God will become visible. I'll be able to experience him personally just as the Bible describes Adam and Eve doing in the Garden of Eden. I'll be able to walk with Jesus, talk with him, see him, hear him, feel his hand on my shoulder, feel his arms around me. That hope, that confidence gives me peace in every storm. As a Christian, I feel that I am called to live a life that embodies love, I'll reject sin and the injustice it inflicts in all its forms. I'll bind up the wounded, rescue the perishing, and introduce those blinded by pain to the source of comfort I have found. But most of all, I will live all of these things in my own personal life. The comfort of home, like the Taylor children, that home be nothing like nothing I've ever known. It'll be like nothing I can imagine, except in one regard. It will be where Jesus will be. I look forward to wrapping my arms around him and shouting, I'm home. I'm home. Can I prove that this is going to happen? No. But I would rather live a life with a hope that pierces through the grave to someone, to something beyond, then struggle to impart purpose to a life that ends in meaninglessness. Of course, once again, this hope rests on the foundation of accepting the possibility of a God who loves, who communicates, and who saves. Will you join me in accepting that possibility? Be safe, my friends. As COVID surges once again, be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I don't know where I'll be next week. Some things are happening down here in Oklahoma that may keep me longer than expected, or I may be at home. But I hope to see you. Have a good week.